Welcome to the Human Conversation Podcast with Jules White, the real dragon slayer, author and entrepreneur sales coach. Tune in weekly for Human Conversation about business and sales. Enjoy business expert interviews, educational episodes and virtual cuppers with entrepreneur business owners. So grab yourself a cuppa and enjoy. Here is your host, Jules White. So welcome to the Human Conversation and I've got a fabulous guest today. I know I always say this Travis and then I tell all the listeners that I've got a fabulous guest but all my guests really are so wonderful and so unique and that's the thing you see. So I've got Travis King. So I mean look what a name to start off with. Um, He is the founder of the Community Builders. Is that right Travis? Yeah, so the Community Builder Show is the podcast I run, and then the Community Builder is the community consultancy that I'm working with. Fantastic, and we're going to find out all about that. So look, welcome to the Human Conversation. It's so lovely to have you here. Thanks, Jules. I'm excited to be here. And you're all the way from? I am in New York City, so Long Island, New York City in the United States. I love that so much. Um, So, you know, we're international on this podcast, which is even more exciting. So let's find out about Travis because I'm excited to dig a bit deeper. So Travis, um, I usually try and start with, uh, what did you want to do when you left school? When I left school. It wasn't that long ago, so don't pretend. (laughs) Well, it's funny. So I I actually had a conversation with my, I call her Auntie Amy, and she's our director of career development at Moravian. And when I graduated, one of the things that I thought about was, I don't know what I'm doing when I leave school. (laughs) And so... I stepped back for a little bit and I was like, hmm, do I go into business? Do I go into fitness? And I kind of stumbled my way a little bit and um, had the, you know, track football background and also had the interest of like going into like personal training. And then all, and then I was like, well, what am I supposed to do with this like business degree? And so t- t- short answer, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I left college yeah and you know what I didn't either and I left at 16 because back when I was at school we could leave at 16 imagine how young that is 16 it's incredible isn't it and and I said to my mum you know what shall I do and she said you you need to write 50 letters she said write 50 letters Um, and I did to all the companies locally insurance companies banks offices and I got three jobs offers Um, And then I took one of them, which was at NatWest Bank. So I was at NatWest Bank. That was my first ever job, you know. So, and it's interesting. I don't think there's many people who really purely know what they want to do at this early age of sort of leaving education, Travis. I don't know what you think. No. And, And I think that's a piece of it right now that I'm also experiencing with people around me is that there's not no one really knows what they want to do even once you get to the professional world um there's a very few people that i really know that i can honestly say like they fell into their passions and they're doing exactly what they wanted to do at whenever they decided it years ago Mm -hmm. and so i think for most people it's more of a journey of exploring what matters to you and how you drive impact in the world versus knowing what you should or shouldn't be doing with your professional career. Yeah, I love that. I love that a lot because I think it's important for us to talk about that. You know, this whole, you should, you should go to college or university. You should get a degree. You should definitely work in law or, you know, banking or, um, you know, my English teacher said to me, you've got a job in a bank. It's a job for life, he said to me, you know, all those years ago. Goodness me, I'm so glad it wasn't a job for life, Travis. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that it wasn't for you either. There, 
there's definitely a whole lot more outside of a bank and nothing against anyone that is in banking. No, obviously. It's just that's not for us. No, that's right. That's right. So look, what did you do? Because you didn't know necessarily what you wanted to do. What was that first thing you did? Did you work for a company? Yeah. So honestly, I did similar to you. When I graduated, I called, I don't know if, I don't know the exact number, but I know I connected with one alumni in particular. His name was Jeff Jensen and he left us a few years ago. And one of the things that he did for me was put me in contact with where I ended up getting my first real job in New York city. And it similar to you, I, I cold called a few alumni didn't know what I was doing. I was trying to build an app at the time. So we were trying to build like a Groupon competitor that when you were in a certain geographical like radius from a retailer, like let's say a Target or a Walmart, it would give you notification about the deals that were happening in the store. So like imagine, you know, uh, brochure meets just like push notification and like that's what it was. Um, and that's what we were trying to build. Didn't really know anything about anything. Had a meeting with a potential investor and went nowhere. But um, the reason I say that story is because when I was talking with Mr. Jensen, he was just giving me, you know, some guidance and advice and just telling me stories about what he was going through, kind of, you know, spending a lot of time in the corporate marketing world and then moving on into startups and kind of pushing his ideas forward and helping other founders and entrepreneurs mold their ideas. Um, I just learned a lot really, really fast as a 22 year old. And so spent a little bit of time at a um, small entrepreneurial, um, I guess, consultancy where they, you know, we built websites, we did a lot of tech, excuse me, like IT and technology sort of things. Um, I did a lot of marketing. So like managed, you know, ad campaigns for uh, a local insurance client, uh, did some some website development for some other entrepreneurs. And um, then one day he just goes, yeah, if, if you want to get that experience you're, you're looking for, like you're going to need to go to New York City. So he called up one of his, you know, former colleagues and, and former, I'm pretty sure she worked on his team actually. And they, you know, said, hey, Trav, you know, go to New York, do an information interview. Um, you're going to meet with a couple of different people at the agency and, you know, there's not a job or anything there, but it's just like, you'll get the experience. Right. And so I went up there, talked with them, turned out there was, you know, a position and ended up started working in New York city at a marketing agency at, I think I was 24. Amazing. Yeah, right. So it was just like, you know, started out, didn't really know what I was doing stayed home for a little bit, which I actually want to throw in. So like after college, I was at home. So I turned down a job offer to go work at Continental selling tires, like the whole cushy, you know, great salary. They'll pay for your, you know, your, your house, your car, all that stuff. And I turned that down to go work for an entrepreneur. If you can't find any themes, right? Like I don't think that would have been for me. And so yeah, a long-winded answer to, to kind of how I got started. No, that's great. Um, so what was the point where you suddenly said, I'm going to do this on my own? Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's just a piece of me, Jules. Like, I, when I was in college, I started an internship program just literally because I realized I was spending so much time in the, you know, career development office. And I was like, can we get credit for this, Auntie Amy? And she was like, I think so. Like, yeah, we could turn it into something. Like, you know, give us a proposal. um, Let us know what you're thinking. And then like, we can figure out a way to make it work. And, you know, one meeting led to another. And then me and my friend JT ended up starting a career internship program at my school, which is still actually going today. And so like, I always had some sort of, thing in me to do things on my own yeah um but also i'm i'm trying to also think about like when that actually started and like i said i'm i think it just was always there like i always wanted to figure out a way to to do things on my own but i also do enjoy being a part of a a good team 
when there's great leadership in place. Like that's a huge caveat for me. Yeah, that's really interesting because I think I'm sure that you and I, when we first connected, which I think was on LinkedIn, wasn't it, Travis? I think you commented on one of my posts and then this magic relationship started, um, mm-hmm. which is what LinkedIn's all about, to be honest. But I, I feel like we had this conversation all around leadership because, you know, one of the big things in my career was, I didn't very often have great leaders. And so I was the one then who was actually leading without maybe realizing it. And ultimately that showed that I was really quite entrepreneurial um, and I was quite comfortable to just then take that risk, if you like, to go and lead on my own. And yet you're right. There's something really nice to have a team to work with, isn't there? I, I definitely feel that myself, even though I'm entrepreneur on my own a solopreneur, if you like, in my business. I think team's important. Yeah, and I think it's another thing that's important to consider for people listening is like the people you surround yourself with. And so as an entrepreneur, it's hard to really think about like, okay, you are surrounding yourself like 80% with like your customers and your clients and people you're doing business with. And then what are you doing with that other 20% of your time? Like how many peers are in your circle? So one of the things I learned along the way has been you need to associate yourself with a couple of people that you can mentor with a couple of people that are on your same similar level, right? Like solopreneurs, other founders, other, um, in my case, like community builders, and then people that are above you and people that are and have already achieved things that you're looking to accomplish And then even one step above them and seeing what people that are two stages ahead of you have accomplished it from Mm -hmm. a professional setting or even just a a personal setting, right? Like maybe they have kids and they have a, you know, hundred million dollar business instead of a $20 million business. Mm -hmm. And once you start to, to see the differences between, you know, someone you're mentoring, someone that's on your same level, someone that's one level above you, someone that's two levels above you, you can kind of start to get a, a more clear picture around where you fit in if you're still trying to figure that out. Yeah, um, and that, so. it's a real big picture view as well, isn't it? Like you say, of, of all of it, which is, I, I like that. I like that a lot. I don't suppose I've ever really thought about that when I've connected to the people I've connected to. And yet, if I look at those people, they're probably all on that map somewhere, aren't they? You know, it's really fascinating to look at it that way. Right. So look, tell me, uh, because that brings me nicely on to community builders. So, yeah. So the community builder started as a hackathon idea. I was inside of a community focused company. Not sure how familiar your audience is with Meetup. Oh, yes, um, we have that here in the UK. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the community app Meetup, I was inside of there. And um, I think probably two or three times a year, they do hackathons. And I happened to be participating in this one and, and was like, hmm, what could I do that? I wouldn't need to work with anybody else on. And this is like the introvert in me, uh, mainly also because like, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with developers and product people, but like if they have the chance to build something on their own, like they're going to build what they want to build. Like not many of them want to say, Hey, I want to build this thing for somebody else. Yeah. Um, but there are a few that, that, that do want to build stuff and like would rather lend their talent. So like, I don't, there's, there's a multitude of different types of developers, but Um, I was like, what could I do that I don't need anybody else for and that I can do on my own in, you know, two days. So tell us, tell us uh, just quickly, tell us what is a hackathon just in case someone's listening and they're not really quite sure what that even means. Yeah. So a hackathon is where you spend, uh, you know, a short amount of time putting together a minimum viable, a minimum viable product of some capacity that you know, you can use to test an idea to solve a problem. Okay. So very, very like MVP lightweight sort of um, things. And sometimes like you, some great ideas come out of hackathons. Right. And um, for me, it was like, okay, what, what can I do right now that will actually drive impact personally and professionally? And 
it was a podcast. So I was like, you know what? Like, let me start to interview different community builders and see like what community building is, who's doing it well, and like what does success look like in that space, right? Because again, I had previously come from you know small entrepreneur marketing agency in that ed tech startup for a little bit, and then now I was like, well, what does community mean in this world that we're calling community, right? Like, what does that mean? And so I started to do a lot of research and got in contact with a bunch of amazing people. Like I can't even begin to, to say how much these people have helped me in my journey. Um, and it, it turned into something that now is starting to kind of have more legs than just a podcast. Um, and so I'm, I'm starting to, you know, do some facilitations So really thinking about how to have meaningful and impactful conversations that most companies typically avoid. And so kind of think about bringing in uh, a facilitator to do some sustained dialogue where instead of just bringing up, so like right now, the, the, the hot topic of the world is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah. Like it is, it's just a thing. So many more people are talking about now. Yeah. And so a lot of times I find that, especially in conversations and moderating panels, the people that need to have the conversations aren't equipped to facilitate the conversations. Yeah. And so I'm trying to help companies facilitate more of these because Again, it's not a thing that's been done a lot, I feel. And on top of that, I'm trying to also um, figure out exactly how this plays out. Because for me, it's also, it's also new, right? Like I facilitated many conversations and discussions and now it's just coming in and bringing in, you know, the metrics along yeah. with that. So I'm making sure people understand, you know, how are we benchmarking and giving, giving ourselves a starting point. And then what sorts of things are we doing to then drive success? And so um, to high level, I help companies facilitate difficult conversations. And I specifically come from sales and marketing. And so helping those teams solve some of their problems is kind of where my, you know, initial interest is and what I want to help with first, because I definitely feel like there's an immediate impact that can be made there. And then um, th- the next side of things is, is figuring out how to contain and continue the conversations internally and not just make these a one-time thing. Yeah, right? yeah. So really sustaining the dialogue over time. That's huge because, you know, there's so many things get talked about and then no actions come out of it, you know, and, and this is a massive part of anything, isn't it? You can talk about it as much as you like, but what's ultimately the key is the actions that come out the other side of it, because that's what makes change, you know? So that's really important, that bit. I'm interested in the whole community builder thing in terms of, you know, what it started as a podcast, which is great. It started as conversations, didn't it? Um, what did you really start learning? Did you sort of see trends and patterns and things that you were really learning about this whole community piece you know tell us tell us more about that Travis yeah so one of the things that was astoundingly consistent across almost every story I've you know heard has been the idea of of belonging and at some point I'd say almost every person I've talked to went on a journey for belonging And how they started or what the exact emotions felt like might differ. But at the end of the day, everybody was looking or searching for belonging. So this was a note that I wrote to myself um, back in 2018. And so I'm going to read it to kind of give everyone like the understanding of what I mean by this. Yeah. And so here it is. Travis. Writing you on Tuesday, August 21st, 2018, during a meetup now. You're going to look back at this note and laugh, but you used to be alone. And you used to care about what people thought, but now you're free. You're doing what you love and making an impact in more people's lives than you can ever have dreamed of. Keep going. 
never stop. Travis. Oh, I love that. That's, that's so powerful, isn't it? So yep. how, how do you feel when you read that now? I feel like I'm trying to figure out where I was. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, that's what I think everybody goes through. And whether they started early because they grew up with divorced parents and they were, you know, going from place to place and having to deal with different cultures at the same time when they're still figuring out what the world is or their parents are traveling the world and they're going along with them and they're trying to figure out how to fit in in different cities and different places that they know nothing about either. Right. So it's, it's, there's a lot of, of times that I find that can, the consistent theme of people were looking for a sense of belonging no matter where they were just because they needed it. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I'd say that, that was a huge pattern. And, and like the other thing too, a lot of people that I've, I've talked to, they build the communities because it was a need they had themselves. Yeah. So, for example, an amazing community of women now, I think they're over 70,000 strong, um, but it's the ladies get paid community. And uh, a, a friend of mine, Claire Wasserman, runs that. And she had that need when she was in her career. She wanted to you know get paid what she deserved and she wanted to negotiate and actually you know get what she deserves in the workplace right yeah and so out of that need for her own you know professional development and growth she then started sharing with other women to now having an a, a you know an army now of yeah. 70,000 women globally that are helping empower women everywhere right so a lot of times it's if you can solve a need for yourself, chances are there might be a few other people that have that same need. And I think it's, it's difficult because what do you hear in marketing? Serve your customers, give them what they need. But the interesting thing about that is, is if you don't have what you need, you can't serve anybody. Yeah, yeah. And, and this, is, this is wonderful. What a great, I knew this was going to be a great conversation because when I created Live It, Love It, Sell It, as a methodology around sales because I was so fed up of seeing it as this process driven steps of the sales stuff that was really transactional. Um, I knew that we had to start with live it and the live it part was, are you fit to travel the sales road trip? So are you fit to travel? So you've got to start with you. And then when you understand who you are and your why and your values, your strengths, that's when you're able to then start to create your connections with your ideal clients and then understand the same about them. And what I really love about what you've just said about this lady, Claire Wasserman, okay, because we can make sure we perhaps put a link as well in the, in the mm -hmm. comments for her. Um, what you said about her is really interesting. It was fulfilling a need for her and then she was able to share that with this bigger community. And often an ideal client, when you do that work, is who you used to be. And so because you knew who you were once and you now know who you are now, you know what you can help people with, what journey you've been on. And that's, that's the value you then bring, isn't it? So... This is so amazing because it connects so beautifully to everything you're saying, you know. We are, you know, we are tribal. We need this connection. We need this belonging, this feeling of belonging. I love this. Yeah, and there's, and I definitely would love to link out to, I have a whole stack of books for anybody that are, is interested in, in trying to get an understanding of what belonging is and how other people have framed that in the past. We have belong. belong. Switch. But this one's a great one for finding your people, creating a community and living a more connected life. And it's like, it's really awesome too, for anybody that's like visual, you'll kind of like this book because it, yeah. it gives you, you know, some, some diagrams and, and ways to, to kind of think about this. Um, and this is a great one. Just like the frameworks of like friendship and showing up, there's a lot of great stuff in here. Um, so that's one I'd recommend. Yeah. Second one is Get Together. I love these um, book covers. They look so Yeah, they're... Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and so this one is by a, a few friends of mine. So Bailey Richardson, Kevin Wynn, and Kai Elmer Soto over at People and Company. So this book is about how to be, build a community with your people. And they use a framework that I really, really love. And it is, you know, a three-step framework. So it's spark the flame. So getting your people together, stoking the fire. So sticking together and then passing the torch and that's growing together. So they've oh, laid out that. a nice framework for like kind of how communities kind of evolve over time and how people can get together with their people. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sure you're familiar with this one. The Art of Gathering. Yep, by Priya Parker. And so this one is more about the art of gathering and you know how we meet and why it matters. And so some of the big things in here that I, I talk about a lot are creating alternative worlds. So creating moments where people literally feel like they've been uh, transported into a new place with a set of people and they can't really tell that this isn't reality. They just are in the moment for that period of time. And then once they you know, leave that, then they kind of go back to reality, but going into that sacred transformational space together is like the whole point of making something transformative, right? Making yes. sure it's disputable, um, making sure that it's, it has boundaries and it says who it's for, who it's not for. Um, and like the other one I really love, like the other piece of this book I really love is uh, the idea of harnessing safe heat and, and that's one of the things I think a lot of companies will benefit from, especially right now. And so that she follows like a, a four step process to, to help harness safe heat, right? So it's what conversations are you avoiding? What is the gift in facing these things that you avoid? What's the risk in facing it? And is the risk worth it? Yeah. Right. So if the gift is greater than the risk, then you probably should proceed. But if the gift's not greater than the risk, then maybe you can, you know, let it go. So yeah. and then the last one is Bowling Alone. And so this one's more of a deeper book that kind of goes into the, you know, development of what it's like, uh, in the American world and kind of like what we went through. Um, and, and it's, it's kind of, it's a deep book. It's a little bit thicker. Right. Um, and, it, and it's definitely more of the, like going on this journey alone, like bowling alone. Right. Yeah. Um, and this one, it's a little heavier, but it, it, it was a great, great learning piece. And um, I read this one a while ago. So the, the big highlights are, are, are still fuzzy for me, but I, it was another, another good one um, that's in the library. So, just some recommendations for anybody listening uh, to, to pick up some community knowledge. They sound great. They sound really good. And could people get those on Amazon, for instance, Travis? Because obviously some of um, the listeners here are in the UK. So do you think they'd be able to find these books on, on Amazon? Yep, they will. Yeah, which is great. So you're all about community. Um, just so that we, because I could talk to you forever. Um, you know that because I love our conversations. I'm fascinated with community. Um, I know every single solopreneur working on their own, the biggest thing they crave is a community of their own, which is yep. done through networking in the UK. We have lots of networking groups. Um, this online world has been amazing for communities. LinkedIn particularly, I think we're finding these lovely mini communities that we're fitting into and, and we find them hugely supportive, don't we? Which is lovely. Um, so, and that sense of belonging is, is massive. It's massive. And actually it's, it's hugely linked, I think, to mental health. I mean, we could go into a whole new conversation just on that level, couldn't we? That feeling of actually not belonging somewhere can, can be quite detrimental, can't it? 100%. And I'd say one of the best things for me has been recently starting to realize that I need to do more. Um, what's the nice way to put this? I need to be more disputable. And the reason is, is because there aren't a lot of people that are saying things that anyone else isn't saying. Yeah. Like everyone's saying pretty much the same thing in a lot of places. 
And for me, I'm like, that's boring. <laughs> like, I don't want to hear you talk about the same things that we can find. You know, I want to talk about things that nobody's talked about before. Yeah. Right. Like, I want to have the conversations that most people are trying to avoid. And I think on the other side of that are the breakthroughs that a lot of people are looking for. Yeah. So the mental health aspect of things. I So one piece of this that, that I'm going to be more intentional about is really implementing Dunbar's number a lot more in my world. So for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's basically a number that says how many social relationships any one person can manage at a time. Okay. And so Dunbar's number is around like 50. So it's a typical number of people we can keep track of and consider a part of our ongoing social network. And it's 50. It's a, so it's 150 is like the, the big number is for the wow. tribe. 150 in the tribe, 50 people in your clan, 15 people in your super family, and then five close friends. Amazing. I love that. It is, I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? When you explain it like that, it makes complete sense. We couldn't possibly be in touch with 150 people all at once, could we really? So, and it's how it works, isn't it? It's how it works. Yeah. And, and that's the other piece that I think a lot of us are forgetting about, especially that are building our own businesses. Trying to manage a pipeline of 300 people is ridiculous. Yeah. It just unless you're a high powered sales rep and you're trying to just do, you know, smile and dial and just boom, 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 which good we luck don't if believe you're doing in that. that. We don't believe I, in that, do we? <laughs> no. So I'm like, good luck if you're trying to do that. Right. But, um, it's more about if you had five key people that you had to build a relationship with over a year to get you to the next stage of your business, who would those five people be? Yeah. I love so if that. you ask yourself yeah. that question, you're like, oh, so if you don't know, then well, maybe start identifying who the five people that yeah. would make the biggest impact in your business would be. Yeah. And then outside of that, like the super family, like, all right, well, who's the next 15 in line that you want to talk to at least every quarter, right? Like a couple of times a year. And then who do you talk to, you know, once or twice a year, no matter what. And that's like your other group of 50. And then it's like, all right, who are the one-off ties that you might engage with here and there, but you're not really la allowing them to be in that close friend circle because th there's not room for everybody. And I think yeah. that's a huge, huge piece that more of us should start to think about. Like, yes, we're in networking and, and community building modes. And yes, we're trying to build more relationships, but there is a limit that I want everybody to be cognizant of and you should think about what matters to you right like this is all just me coming from personal experience saying hey if i try to manage too many relationships at once it not only hurts the relationships that matter but it also is detrimental to me because i'm now in a place where i'm trying to manage too many things at once mm -hmm. and i'm not actually giving myself what i need and i'm giving other people my energy when I need to be preserving that so I can serve my community and my people. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, it's just, it's great. They talk about when you're um, on an airplane to put the oxygen mask on yourself first, don't they? What a great analogy for what you've just talked about. And, and it's exhausting to try and manage too many relationships and then they won't be quality. You won't have that quality in there that you need. So look, just to kind of uh, two last things I want to talk to you about, because we mm -hmm. are going to have to bring this to a, a fab fabulous close, which I feel sad about. Um, but the first thing is this, um, how can people get in touch with you? So LinkedIn, you can just type in Travis Andre King. I'm pretty active on there. That's probably the best way to find me. And then if you want to uh, talk anything deeper or want don't want to share on LinkedIn, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. And my email is Travis at community builder show.com. Great. And we'll put the links into the notes as well, Travis, obviously. Um, 
because I want to make sure people really do connect with you because you're such a fabulous guy. Um, I, I think you're very insightful. I've learned something on this conversation. I always like to think I will when I speak to people and have my <laughs> human conversations. But, you know, the, I love this principle of having these five people that you can identify because, you know, if you, if you don't know who they are, find them, you know. Isn't that a lovely message, I think, for people who are listening? Um, one last message. What do you want to leave our listeners with, Travis? Be intentional. Yeah. So really think about why you're showing up to the things you're showing up to. And would those things that you show up to actually miss you? Fascinating. Yeah, isn't that great? I'm going, oh, I'm thinking now, oh. I, I'd like to think that everything I do is actually intentional for the right reasons, because I think that's probably just standard, isn't it? Because I have, uh, one of my values is integrity. And so I kind of want to think that, you know, when I do do something, it's for the right reason, but I might need to go and explore that, you know? I think it's worth it, isn't it? <laughs> you, you owe it to yourself, Jules. And, yeah. and, and I do this myself too. And so if, if that's one thing that I can help other people, you know, get some insight into like what I'm thinking about, it's like, do all of these things that are on your calendar matter? Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. I've got I some know. work to do, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Listen, thank you so much for joining me on The Human Conversation. I've loved chatting to you and I knew I would. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much, Jules. It was a pleasure being here. It's been amazing. And listeners, I hope that you have really enjoyed this. It's been amazingly insightful. So much gold in this. If you guys don't take at least five things away from this podcast, then I would be so, so surprised. But look, think about community. Think about how you build your community, how you use your community. Think about the sense of belonging, you know, and, and get this, this right and be intentional. As Travis says, this is massive for us. Thank you for listening. Uh, make sure that you like and subscribe wherever you've listened. We're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, Stitcher, and also SoundCloud. Until next time, I'm just going to say thanks for listening and ta-ta for now. You've just been listening to the Human Conversation podcast with Jules White. To find out more about the other work that Jules does, please visit her website, www.liveitloveitsellit.co.uk. And if you enjoyed the podcast, then please do leave a rating and review on the platform you use to enjoy her show. Thanks for listening and see you next time.